It's uh, nice to be here in Fargo, city of 100,000 not particularly famous people and one extremely famous wood chipper. <laughs> I've not only been able to meet said wood chipper, but also now the Madonna of Fargo, so my life is complete. Uh, the wood chipper was actually a big deal to me because when I was 13, the movie Fargo was my favorite movie. <laughs> I was a pretty strange 13-year-old. I was probably the only 13-year-old in the country that watched the movie enough until I had memorized the entire script. And so I think there's kind of an unspoken bond between me and the people of Fargo, and that I am privy to the knowledge that all of the psychopathic tendencies of the movie, all of the stuffing of other people into wood chippers, as usual, goes on in Minnesota. <laughs> Ugh, Minnesota again. North Dakota's got to take the fall for your shenanigans. <laughs> But to people outside the Midwest, it's kind of like, well, I mean, is there a difference between North Dakota and Minnesota? Aren't they both Canadian provinces? <laughs> this is kind of what I envision if you were to give somebody from outside a map of the Midwest, how they would fill it in. So here we are today in the state of Fargo, whose major cities are Woodchipper, Alaska, and Hitler. And just to our south is, hmm, this is a tricky one, followed by Kansas. Or wait, is this one Kansas? And I'm from over there, right in the middle, the great state of Ohio, the potato state. <laughs> or no, no, am I from Idaho? Or Iowa? No, yeah, I'm from Iowa. The, vo uh, it's the vowels are so tricky. <laughs> it was like in the 1800s, it was the opposite of Wheel of Fortune. And they were trying to find a way to create as many states as they could with only one consonant. <laughs> I'd like to buy a consonant, please, Pat. And I didn't really think a whole lot about Iowa or about the Midwest until I left. I went to study history at the University of Pennsylvania, and it was there that I was really overcome with the total lack of understanding of our home region. I got a lot of questions that I expected. Are your parents farmers? Did you grow up in a cornfield? <laughs> like, well, I need some sort of covering to protect the rain. I also got questions I didn't get, like, is there snow all the time in Iowa? Can you fix a toilet? I heard that more than once. I think apparently people attribute like superhuman handyman skills to people from Iowa. <laughs> and I realized that the main thing about my region that made it interesting was that it's really an international land of mystery. And when you start looking at fiction, there's all sorts of mysterious figures who are pulled from the Midwest. You have Magnum P.I. from Detroit, Iowa, or from Detroit, Michigan. You have <clears throat> Twilight's Edward Cullen is from Chicago. And one of the most famous men of mystery at all, Jay Gatsby, is from North Dakota. And the reason for that is that people kind of have these two totally different ideas of the Midwest in their mind. And both are almost polar opposites. And they balance, for my money, on the word simple. Now, on the positive side of simple, you have Kansas native Superman. Honest, hardworking. Wanting nothing more than to stand with his wife and his pitchfork in front of his house, waiting for the neighbor's cat to be rescued from a tree. This is the pro side of simpleness. And on the other side of simpleness, you have the, I don't know what the word is, that we are, oh right, dumb as bricks. <laughs> this is the guns and religion side, that we want nothing more to stand with our wives, our pitchforks, our shotguns, our crucifixes, fearing anybody with a passport, <laughs> voting for Ronald Reagan, whether he's running or not, <laughs> and waiting in joyful hope for the second coming of Christ. And so as I kind of understood this idea of how people viewed the Midwest, I became just interested in what actually tied the region together, what made the people who they are. And so I spent the last couple of years reading about the Midwest casually, and over the last year it's been more or less my full-time job of reading about the Midwest and annoying almost everybody I know by inserting little facts about who is from the Midwest in every conversation. <laughs> and I've discovered that the people of the Midwest, everybody will be happy, are actually a higher being than most others. I, as you can see, we've gone from chimp to caveman to cowboys fan to Yankees fan to Midwesterner. It's kind of a combination of intelligent design and evolution. Jesus plus Darwin. Darzes, or Jesus. Deezes. If you just look at some of the people from the Midwest, it's a pretty impressive list from Dwight Eisenhower, Orson Welles, Elliot Ness, Neil Armstrong, Amelia Earhart, Larry Page, down to John Malkovich and Fred Astaire. What's more impressive is that I put all the names of every Midwesterner who's ever existed into a hat. It's obviously a, it's obviously a big hat. And I pulled all of these out at random. On the other side, I took all the names of every non-Midwesterner that's ever existed, found an even larger hat, put them in, and this is what I come up with. <laughs> <clears throat> 
destroyers of humanity from Hitler to the Kardashians with Pol Pot, Joseph Stalin, and Kesha in between. Now the Midwest has literally never produced a tyrannical despot that tried to exterminate populations. Just not in our nature. <laughs> Yet still we get kind of this bad rap. There's an arc of history that almost everybody has bought into, whether it's journalists, and people kind of say it as a fact. If you look at the mid-19th century through today, it's divided too into the Superman phase and the clinging to guns and religion phase. In the early years, it's the Superman Midwest, just knocking it out of the park, hit after hit, the invention of the car, the invention of the plane, mass production, F. Scott Fitzgerald, Ernest Hemingway, everything is coming up Midwest. We even stuck a guy on the moon. And we peak around the middle of the 20th century, and then it's just one-way ticket to Crapsville. <clears throat> Heavy industry is now the Rust Belt. Small mom-and-pop farms or massive agriculture working for the high-fructose corn syrup industry. And all we want is for the last one out of the Midwest to just remember to extinguish the tire fire. There's so few people left, everyone's looking for their first exit out. But as I read about the Midwest, there are so many things that don't make sense in this arc. And as a student of history, you realize that history, like anybody else, enjoys trends. It makes things easy to understand. Like, America used to be great when we make stuff. We don't make stuff anymore. We're not great. Anybody can get that. But while it's not 100% accurate, it's a good 98% accurate. So I started to look and said, well, what if the Midwest were its own country? You know, a United States of Midwest. What would it look like? And it would be the fourth largest economy in the world. You've got a $3 trillion economy with only 67 million people, meaning your GDP per person is second only to Japan amongst major economies. You have some of the richest land in the world. You're resource rich. Your Great Lakes have 20% of the world's fresh water. I mean, Canada's not going to put up much of a fight for those. <laughs> <clears throat> and when you look at the companies you have, you have Fortune 500 companies from General Motors, Ford, Berkshire Hathaway. The Midwest and the South have the most Fortune 500 companies in the top 10 of Fortune 500 companies. And even though some of ours, like General Motors, have also had this rise and fall trend, General Motors is still larger than every commercial bank in America. It's larger than Google. It's larger than Apple. These are not small companies. And that's what makes the fall of the Midwest so tricky. A city like Gary, Indiana was once synonymous with steel. It's the only major city founded in America in the 20th century. And it was essentially a factory town, the biggest steel mills in the world. And with the fall, says, and now Gary, Indiana is just a depressing sinkhole. Well, Gary, Indiana produces more steel than ever but they use 10% of the workforce. So the city has indeed changed. With 90% of the workforce gone, you have empty houses, empty factories, empty neighborhoods, but the company is still productive. So it's less of a simple fall of the Midwest, it's more of a transition. And this is something that the Midwest has seen before. The big second industrial revolution of mass production was fueled by cheap labor. And that cheap labor was coming in from rural areas because agriculture had been industrialized. Agriculture was as or more productive with fewer people. Those people went into the cities. The cities fueled the industrial growth. The thing that makes this anxiety prone is because the America and the Midwest in general aren't on this trip downhill just waiting for China to take over and send us to some sort of hospice for countries. America is in a tricky spot because it is so far out in the lead. The path has been set for China and how you go from agricultural society to industrial society. The path for us has not been set. You have to know how you transition a heavy industry economy into the next economy. How do you take cities that were geared towards heavy industry and turn them into non-heavy industry? And what's the next step? And the hard thing is that you'll never know exactly where you're going. <laughs> Otherwise, we would all be heading there. The important thing is the drive to get there. And my favorite example about you know, driving into the unknown, even if you think your best years are behind you, is an aviator in Ohio who grew up idolizing the Wright brothers, and all he wanted to be was an aviator. But as he got older, the things he dreamed of, which were faster planes, breaking the sound barrier, were all being done by other people. And he still wanted to be an aviator and still wanted to discover. But when he joined the Air Force, he told one of his friends, you know, I was born a generation too late. All of the great discoveries in aviation have already been made. And within two decades, 
that was the first person to walk on the moon. <laughs> this was a guy who, for walking on the moon, wasn't even conceivable at the time. But the drive to get there was the most important thing. And for me, I see the drive in the Midwest as a sort of energy. And that's the energy that throws history off. What you can't predict makes history tricky. No one would have said that industrialization of agriculture would lead to the invention of the airplane. Because they're not a connected thing. They're connected when you look back and say, industrialization of agriculture led to more people, led to mass production, led to the achievement of the airplane. But you didn't know what was out in front of you. And America is in that now, of where the cities go. When I moved back to Des Moines in 2005, I had come to the conclusion that there was more potential for me to do what I wanted to do in Des Moines than there was in Philadelphia or New York. And the most amazing thing was that I met all sorts of other people who had come to that same conclusion. My whole block was suddenly regenerating. The first mixed-use building built in Des Moines in 40 years was built only in 2005. The first new apartment building built in Des Moines, and everything was filling up with people. And it's the idea of how do all these people who didn't know each other come to the exact same conclusion at the same time and do the same thing about it. And most amazing is that that same thing goes on in Fargo, in Sioux Falls, in St. Louis, in Cleveland, in Detroit, in Chicago. There's a kind of energy that will determine where we go next. And the Midwest, again, is still producing some of the greatest minds of our time. Larry Page of Google, Twitter, Zorley, Square, Pinterest are all Midwestern minds. Jonathan Franzen, the country's greatest writer, is Midwestern. You have a Midwestern guy in the White House from Chicago running against a guy from Michigan with his running mate from Wisconsin. The Mi Midwest is more politically important than ever. And on the other side of that, the Midwest's two greatest filmmakers, <laughs> Joel and Ethan Cohen, the directors of the movie Fargo. <laughs> and below that, you have this energy that doesn't look at empty factories as a problem, but as potential. Empty factories are turning into lofts, but more importantly, in Milwaukee, a company called Growing Power is using empty factories to turn into indoor year-round farms to produce, you know, lettuce, things like that, to sell to local restaurants, an inversion of local agriculture. As well, companies like LightBank in Chicago, which are behind Groupon, are using their financing power to bring tech companies back into Chicago or elsewhere. But as you go forward, it's good to keep in mind that some of the projections are always hard to know. And when you look at cities, they say, well, in the future, 67% of people will live in cities of a million or more. And that's with the numbers that we have now. That's with trends that continue. But sometimes history will take a turn. You don't know where it goes. And if there's so much energy popping up in smaller cities that says, well, with the internet and with infrastructure, I can do what I want to do everywhere. It's about the community I want to live in. What stops a city like Des Moines or from Fargo or Sioux Falls from becoming the next big city? And when it comes to who's going to push America forward, the Midwest was at the forefront of industrialization, which means it's forced to be at the forefront of developing a post-industrial world. And for my money, when I'm depending on a region to lead the way properly from industrial to post-industrial, I'm going to put my lot with the guys who invented the car, the plane, and brought us Neil Armstrong, the United States of Midwest. Thank you.